Welcome back to Black Bear Forge. Today I want to continue our look into a budget blacksmithing setup. We've been looking at what it might look like to set a budget of around $500 for tools, materials, supplies, everything you need to get started in blacksmithing. In the first video of this series we looked at some very basic tools, a small single burner gas forge, a little 30 kilogram anvil, hammer, tongs, materials to work with, as well as some basic ideas and basic techniques. In the second video, we talked a little bit about safety, the need to wear eye protection, possibility of hearing protection, my thoughts on gloves, things like that. And we looked at making some basic tools, a punch and a chisel. You'll make lots of tools of this sort over your blacksmithing career, so it's a good idea to start learning to do that right from the start. Now when we started this, my recommendation was to buy two 20-foot sticks of 3 8 round bar. If you can find that locally, you might have to pay a little bit more at the home center and buy it in 3 or 4-foot sticks. That first 20 feet of material then was to be used for learning some basic techniques. Learn some hammer control, how to draw material out using the technique drawing out square, then forming it to an octagon, and then going to a round. That's the way you usually work. You don't draw out in the round, even if you're starting with a round stock and ending with a round taper. It's more efficient to draw it out square, then octagon, then round. Today I want to take that second 20-foot piece of material and turn it into 10 each of six different items. I've already cut that bar up into six-inch pieces. Some of these we'll use as the full six inch piece and some we'll do one project on one end, cut it off and use the remaining roughly four inches for another project. The idea here is that you can make enough stuff that would have a sales value that would cover all of your expenses so that you're not in the hole when you're done with this initial setup stage. And we'll talk more about that at the end of this video and get into real detail on that in the next video. But for now, let's get started making some projects. And our first project will be a simple J-hook. Forging simple hooks is a great way to practice fundamental skills. The skill of drawing a piece out square, then octagon, and then round is one of the most basic things in blacksmithing, and you really need to get good at that. You need to practice it hundreds of times before you start to become proficient. So making a batch of hooks like this is a great way to do that. Bend the little curl over the edge of the anvil to get it started. Then come up on the face of the anvil. Try not to strike twice in the same place or you leave a flat spot. So another thing you'll need to practice a lot to become really good at it. Heck, I'm still not that good at it. If you cool the curl off, you're less likely to damage it if you accidentally strike it. And sometimes you have no choice but to strike it while you're bending the hook. Bending in a jig is probably easier, more reliable, and a lot less likely to damage the curl. But since we haven't made any jigs yet, we're going to do it over the horn. With that done, we'll move on to the finial end. I'm just going to put a really simple spade finial on this. That's a real basic technique and you'll use that quite a bit. This starts with a short square taper and then some half face blows over the edge of the anvil. If you can get that taper in on the diamond so that you're forging down, starting at one of the corners, it'll come out a little bit more even. This is a little problematic to punch, and perhaps punching it before we do the hook in might be better, but I generally prefer to put the hole in it as one of the last things I do. Don't know that I've got a good reason for that, just kind of the way I generally do it.
And of course, if things don't line up, heat it up, put it in the vise, and give it a little twist here and a tweak there, and you ought to be able to get everything to line up just the way you want it. Let's move on to a, another style of hook. This one has a flat taper, or a, kind of a flaring taper, and a bit of a fishtail scroll. It's not a real fishtail, but it's kind of getting to that point. And everything is kind of kept in the flat. This means it'll be easier to work with. No half face blows for fitting or anything like that. So this is a pretty basic hook and probably easier than that first one we looked at. First ends where the holes will go and then we're going to do a very similar taper for the actual hook. The hook takes up about two thirds of the material and the hanging portion takes up about a third I suppose. Nothing magical about any of these dimensions or the styles for that matter. Just use your imagination. The main thing is to practice techniques and put a lot of repetition into the same thing so you can get good at it. This one I'm going to go ahead and punch two holes in. I think that looks better on this style of hook. One is more than substantial strength-wise, but I think two just looks better. If you notice on the first hook, it wanted to collapse down into the hardy hole because it was thin. Using a bolster plate, if you have one available or a piece of material to make one, like we showed in the last video, really makes punching a lot easier. But do remember to keep your punch cool, it will last a lot longer. And this S7 that we made the punches out of is okay to quench in water as long as it's not showing any incandescent color. If it's starting to turn red, let it air cool first. This piece is just a little spiral key fob. I'm not sure if these will sell well, but I thought it'd be an interesting exercise. We're going to use about two inches of one of the other six inch bars. The other four inches will turn into something else. And of course, it starts off with the same taper. We're going to forge it out square for a nice even taper, leaving about four inches of the bar to make that other hook out of later. And I'll knock the corners off, but I'm not real worried about making this perfectly round. I don't think it really needs it for this. And I think the little facets and flats kind of help give it an interesting look. Personally, I want this spiral to close up pretty tight, but go ahead and try different things if you want to. Use your imagination and see what you prefer. Let this cool and then I'll hacksaw it off. 
Yes, this vise is really loose and wobbly on the bench. This is a temporary bench made out of scrap material, and it's just an illustration to show that you can get by with some pretty make-do stuff if you have to. In the future, this shop will get a good solid bench made out of some four-inch thick timbers, and we'll have a full-size post vise as well as a regular bench vise. But it's okay to use what you have available and get to work. Again, we're punching holes. We're going to punch a lot of holes. It's okay to drill these holes if you have a drill or a drill press, but there's nothing wrong with punching holes, and it's one of the fundamental skills of blacksmithing. So it's a great exercise to do most of these projects with punched holes instead of going ahead and using the drill, even if you do have one. little slug that comes out is called a biscuit and I'll knock the biscuit out of the bolster plate there that's all the material that's removed when you punch you end up losing more material with a drill bit we're going to use the other four inches of material and make another version of a hook I can't reach all the way to the far edge of the anvil on the face but if I move over to the square horn of this little anvil I can get a better angle at it my tongs aren't holding me up there as with so many other things, we're going to start off with that taper. I'm going to draw it out a little bit longer this time, and this one I'm going to leave square. I'm not going to bother to round it up. I'm going to go ahead and turn this around and work the other end and this is going to get flattened much like the last hook we did so that it has a nice flat kind of flaring end on it and that transitions into the taper. Right at the transition point it's about a quarter inch thick. It kind of tapers as a flat taper towards the end we're working on here and as a square taper to end the tongs have here. Take as many heats as you need to clean it up, make it look just the way you want it to. And of course, there's the little curl on the end. You don't have to do this. This is just sort of a habit I've developed. It's not necessary and different hooks look better with different things. You can do all sorts of different things with hooks. But as I said, the curl is good practice, as is forming the hooks over the horn of the anvil instead of bending in a jig. This one's a little bit wonky, it looks like. But we'll be able to fix that. And once again, I think I'm going to go ahead and punch two holes in this. I think two holes just looks right with this. And I'll be using roundhead wood screws with this, so they look real good and become kind of part of the decorative element of the hook. Cleaning the slug out can be done fairly cold. This isn't just cold enough to hold on to it's down to a black heat but you're shearing that out not punching through so you actually don't want it at a forging heat when you do this second side
Once again, the flat horn on this little anvil comes in handy to get around where you didn't fit otherwise. And of course, take the time to straighten it up and make it what you want. Some of that can be done cold. Now let's work on a little leaf. This can be a pendant, perhaps a key ring, maybe something that hangs from the pull cord on a lamp or ceiling fan. Lots of different things you can do with leaves, but they're really good practice. Starts with a similar square taper that we did with the spade finial, and then I'm going to do half face blows at the far edge of the anvil to establish where the stem of the leaf will go. Half face blows are just with the hammer hanging halfway off the edge of the anvil and halfway over the anvil, so you create a shoulder. Then we'll spread the leaf starting with the face of the hammer, move on to the peen to spread it a little bit, and back to the face to smooth it up. Using the chisel we made from the last video, we're going to give the impression of some veins. A typical leaf would have raised veins, but we're going to go ahead and incise these just because it's a lot faster and easier to do with a chisel. But like most things, there are a lot of different ways you can do leaves. This is just one way. And this is something else that can be done fairly cold. You don't have to have this up at a high foraging heat. If you do, you need to be really careful not to accidentally cut all the way through. The flat leaf really doesn't look very good, so it's in your best interest to heat it up and give it a little shape. And the corner on this little anvil, where it transitions to the horn, is just perfect for that. Now we could let this cool and hacksaw it off, but as we do have a chisel and chiseling hot is certainly an option. Just depends on how much precision you need. We're definitely going to have to make some sort of a hold down for this little anvil. A lot of this would be easier if we could hold on to it. Then we have to draw this down. This is small. It's going to cool off fast. The transition between the stem and the leaf is a stress point. If you work it too cold, it'll be easy to break it there. And it's just kind of fiddly. So this is probably the hardest of all the projects, but if you take your time and go back and forth with the fire with lots of little heats, you'll be able to get this done and you should have something you can be proud of. Again, forge it out square first, then octagon, then round it up. A better pair of tongs would help, but I'm trying to do all of this with the tools that I recommended in the first video, and so far this would be the only pair of tongs that I've talked about. So it is possible to do it with those simple tools we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You can see where that stem is a little thin right by the leaf. It would be real easy to break it off there. a little lopsided so I'm going to use the punch and kind of drift it back open again. 
better to bend it right the first time, but if you need to, this is an option. But in the end, I think we end up with a nice, elegant little leaf with a stem that curls back. And that provides something you can put a, a piece of leather cord or something like that through for necklace or key ring. Whatever it is people might want to do with these. Now the piece that we cut off is a little ragged. If you own an angle grinder, this is a great way to do that. But since an angle grinder isn't part of what we budgeted with our $500 budget, You'll probably need to clean it up with a file. This last project, instead of making another hook, let's make a bottle opener. One that doesn't require a big slot punch and drifts and all that kind of stuff. No forge welding. Just starts off with half face blows at the near edge of the anvil. Probably Oh, an inch, inch and a half of it is what I'm leaving off here. And I'm going to draw that out long enough to make that loop that you typically see on a bottle opener. Now, if anybody's wondering, uh, I did not narrate this while I was forging. I just wanted to get these projects done and show all of these. And I thought I would try narrating after the video was edited. So I'm doing a voiceover sitting in the basement watching the edited video. Uh, let me know if you like this style. I don't know if I like it or not. I'm uh, still kind of waiting to find out. In some ways it's cleaner because I can tell you exactly what I did after the fact instead of trying to explain what I'm doing and then realizing that that's really not what I did later. Sometimes I think I'm going to use a procedure and I end up using a different procedure. Again this comes down to square and then you knock the corners down. I don't think this needs to be perfectly round. It's kind of a choice you can make, but I think knocking the sharp edges off the corner is the very minimum you should do with it. Now that offset makes a place you can bend this and get a near 90 degree bend out of it this way. Be careful not to create a cold shut or a weak spot right at the back of that bend. I'm going to spread that out flat a little bit. And then a bottle opener needs a little sharp spot to get under the bottle cap. A ball punch is a great way to do that, but we haven't made one of those yet. So I'm just using the tip of the horn. Kind of looks like a gate hook at this point. Something else you could do with this. Just fiddle with this until you like the shape of it. Try and get it kind of balanced and it pays to test this out. Nobody wants to buy a bottle opener that won't actually open the bottle of beer they're trying to get into. Now the handle could be left around if you wanted to but I really like it flattened out a little bit. I think that looks a lot better and it gives you just a little bit more practice drawing things out flat and trying to keep it parallel. I do let the end flare some and I think that just makes for a more elegant tool in the long run. I like to put a little hole in there and that way you can put a cord on it that can hang on a hook or something like that. Not strictly necessary, but I think it's a nice addition. Now 
This is also a good place to do a little bit of chisel decoration. I'm just going to make a couple of sets of parallel lines here. Really simple to do. And get one of them a little bit crooked here. We'll see if we can fix that with a file later. And a lot of this stuff will need to be filed. Any sharp spots of the hooks or if the finials aren't symmetrical, they should be filed. Some of these might need a little filing to clean up rough spots before you bend them. And some of them can be filed after they're completely forged. So just go through everything and make sure they're comfortable to hold on to and nobody's going to cut themselves or tear their clothes. And a half round file can get into those chisel lines and kind of clean them up. You can kind of work one corner one way and one the other way to sort of straighten out the crooked cuts there. Like I say, let me know what you think about the voiceover style. If you like it, we'll do more of this. That completes all the forging for our projects. Now it's time to put some kind of a finish on these. If you've been watching my videos for any length of time, you know my preferred finish has been Johnson's Paste Wax. Unfortunately, it is now out of production, and unless you're fortunate enough, like I am, to have a back stock of it, you're not going to be able to find this. I probably have three or four years of it over there in the shipping container, but there are other alternatives. Zach from ZH Fabrication looked into making his own blend of paste wax. I'll put a link down in the video description along with the price. This actually promises to be better than the Johnson's Paste Wax was. But other paste waxes like men wax ought to work as well. You can mix linseed oil, beeswax, and mineral spirits to make your own kind of a paste wax. You can use just straight beeswax or straight paraffin if you want. And you don't have to put wax on them. You can use linseed oil. You can use a clear coat of some sort. Heck, you can paint them with rust-oleum, whatever color you want, if that's what you want to do with it. Personally, I like the wax finish, so that's what I'm going to go with. I like for it to be just hot enough to melt the wax, maybe smoke a little, but not too much smoke. Now, barring any unfortunate occurrence, I should end up with 60 pieces that I can then sell to fund what I'm doing here. That's 10 each of six different designs. Three different hooks, a very simple bottle opener, the leaf key ring or pendant, whatever you want to do with something like that, and the same thing with this little scroll. Not sure how something like this might sell, but I thought it was worth experimenting with. Now, if you're in a position where you don't need this stuff to fund your hobby, you've got enough money in your budget that you can buy the tools and the materials, and you're just full steam ahead, that's great, but I still recommend you kind of follow this exercise. It doesn't have to be these projects. You can come up with any projects you want, but it's the repetition of drawing out square, octagon, round, doing the little curls on the ends of the hooks, bending the hooks, trying to get those curves even over the horn of the anvil. It's the half-face blows on this finial and the half-face blows to isolate the mass for the leaf and more half-face blows to set up the bottle opener. And all of those repetitive tasks really help refine your skills. So I think this is worth doing whether you need to sell these or not. And the more things like this you do, the better you're gonna become. I think it was Alex Steele that did a video some number of years ago, it says you should make 100 leaves. That would be an excellent exercise. And over time, you'd be able to sell 100 leaves as little pendants or keychains, whatever it is you wanna do with those finished leaves. But having said that, my goal is to provide you with information that can possibly help you fund your blacksmithing hobby if the money isn't in the bank. And you need to be able to buy materials and more tools with money earned from blacksmithing. Or maybe you're hoping to turn this into a little side business at some point. Don't quit your day job yet. And in the next video, we are going to discuss how much I'm going to charge for these, where I'm going to list them, some of the other issues that go along with selling stuff, and kind of get into the business aspect of the whole thing. One other thing you'll need here are fasteners to hang these on the wall. 
I've talked about that before, so I will link to a video over on Black Bear Forge 2, I think it is, right down here. After this video, you can go watch that and see some of my thoughts on fasteners that will complement your work instead of distracting from your work. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. Stay safe, wear safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.